I think, um, you know, there's so many verses in the Bible about taking care of the widows and the orphans and the poor, yes. especially yes. those three are mentioned so many times. And, you know, in, in the book of Acts, when like they're electing these people to, so that they have time to preach, they are electing some men to sort of take care of those things. And so, um, I, I, you know, I, I think that we've, we've relinquished a lot of those responsibilities and said, oh, the, you know, the welfare will take care of them, or they can go to, you know, some shelter or something. Uh, in, in Carrie's situation, of course, it's not, it's not like it, uh, it's a poor person, but it's someone who's hurting. And um, reaching out to people who are hurting, I think, is really um, you know, whether you're just like writing them a note, Carrie, if you don't know them very well, um, just letting them know that you're thinking about them. And uh, it's, I think it's very helpful just to um, you do something. I, I don't know if this, I don't know what you think guys think of this, but um, in, I think this is from like Jewish thought that when, when something bad happens in the world, and you can't do anything about it, like someone is kidnapped, like Anson is kidnapped. You're not involved, you can't do anything about it, but you, you, wanna, you wanna help in some way. Um, they, um, they tell people, then you need to do good. You need to go somewhere and do something good. Get involved in bringing good into the world. And the more good that we do, bringing this good into the world, the more you know, brightly our light is shining, just seemed like a good, Thing to do like if you can't do anything to help that person per se <coughs> maybe it's someone you don't even know you know um but you can where you are do good and i just want to wonder what people thought about that idea hmm. yeah I, I think uh if nobody else is going to talk i will uh, the, uh we have um we have our neighbors. Everyone is our neighbor. And we drive past, going to minister to people, we drive past people that are right next door that need something. Everybody's hurting. Everybody needs ministry at certain times. Everybody. You don't have to go over land and sea to find people. Right. They're as close as your family around you and your friends. And I, I think a lot of people that don't want to bring it up when they need something they they just i got nobody to talk to you know i just want to put on a happy face i saw this at church people's marriages are shambles but they're going to go and show up until the week they get divorced and act like everything's okay at, at church to put on a good face and that's not that's not doing any good we, we need to be i mean real we need to have relationships around us and, and um and minister and be aware when things are brought up across our paths to interject where we can when we can right and we need to choose to do it i think it's all of our job if we want to be you know the people of the light people of the way our father's children we want to follow after the messiah we just minister to everyone uh, anyway that's my, that's my little my little ramble the way the way I've always kind of dealt with this, <clears throat> I've always thought the phrase always came out in me is like, wise as a serpent, gentle as a dove. You know, it was like, for example, I got some close family that speaking of marriages, you know, it's, they're young and it's getting rocky. And, and I see, I see my grandson, where he could step up and do some things different other than thinking he's the king, you know, not the king, you know, like uh, the woman, should, the little woman should be mis man, submissive kind of, thing. you know, and he's young and he ain't been, he ain't been, uh, he ain't been taught, you know, he kind of learned that from other people kind of running roughshod of a situation anyway. And I'm trying to talk to him through different ways, not directly like, Example, just this other week, weekend or so ago, uh, you know, his dad really 
wants, wants to see him but manipulates him in a way as well. Or you're, well, your, your wife won't let you kind of scenario, you know, just as a side. And that's wrong because all of a sudden that's casting a battle between him and his dad and the wife. And, you know, and that's just stupid. So I, and I told him as, as best I could without offending anybody. Uh, like his, I said, look, you're, you're, you got to worry about your family first and do it for them first and your little home around you. That's most important. If other people are trying to manipulate you for their time, see through that and give them some time, but keep, keep the focus on you and your family because, man, you've got two kids and a great little wife, and she does everything, you know, but the, the other family members talk bad about her, like she's lazy or she's not. You know what I mean? There's all kinds of satanic evil stuff to, to break it apart, and I think that's by design nowadays is to break marriages apart, especially young family units, but... He just, I just had to be, I had to give it to my father and not offend anybody, you know, be wise about it. But, but gentle, but, you know, it, it's tough. And when people are hurting, best thing I can do is try to share my experience, you know, and strength and hope. Best thing I got to give them is hope. You know, it's not all, it's not nearly as doomed as it looks at this point. You know what I mean? It's not nearly as bad as it seems. And it can't even get worse, and it won't get as bad as you think it is because, you know, you just have to trust your father in heaven. That's the hardest thing, you know I mean? But I, I just try to, I don't know, mainly I try to ask my father, well, what would you have me do, you know, and, and just give me the wisdom because I don't know. I got to trust him because every situation is different, especially with grief and stuff, you know what I mean? I just go with my personal experience on that. Heck, I got kicked out of a funeral home at my mom's viewing, you know, when I was young. I was drunk and stupid. You know, that's how I was dealing with it. And that, and I was cussing that place. And, uh, you know, it's really not funny, but at the time, the, the guy that owned the place come up and said, oh, you're going to have to leave, you know. And I, I was ready to leave with him with some knots on his head, you know what I mean? But that was just anger misplaced you know what i'm saying so i use that and know how all that it, the stuff will twist you for a while you know and there's ways to be around it but it's just what what have i been through and how can i diffuse and help that with my father's glory you know and that's all i can do you know but it took a lot of years to learn this you know so i expect i know when especially these younger kids who have nothing no grounding hardly at all, my word. It's like, where do you start? Where do you tie in these loose ends and get some kind of foundation? And they're needing it, and they're wanting it. But I consider young 40 and under, you know what I'm saying? So it's, you know, anyway. That's kind of, that's my two and a half cents worth. You know, just experience strength and what I've been through and ask my father. He's the one that changes. It's an inside job for everybody, to me. This is my, this is George's uh, philosophy or, or idea right? for the moment, which is subject to change. But, you know, my father works from the inside out. You know, that's the only way, you know. I, so I, I have to just ask for his will to be done and for me not to get in the way of that will, you know, because some people, some people got to go through, yeah, how you say, got to go through hell to get, get to the other side. You know, you have to learn that. You have to learn. And I'm, I don't know what's best for that person, personally. You know, yeah, it's a tearjerker. It's terrible. What's going on? How can this be? Well, my father knows everything, and he knows his plan, not George, you know. So I have to, A, not judge that and get all huppy and, you know, angry at this situation. But, yeah, that's it. Sorry. Thanks. That was good, George. I, I hope the young young people listen to the gray hair, because you have something to tell them. So that's that's great. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah, go ahead, Martha. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> oh. 
trying to figure this out. So do we have the camera so the camera can be on us so we can come on the screen? You can have you can have the camera on or off. It doesn't matter. Um, Ty and I, we both can't have our, our cameras on at the same time because it slows down our bandwidth. Uh -huh. So th that's why we end up turning it off. But occasionally I, I like to I like to turn mine on just to let people know that I'm here and I'm listening because sometimes when it's a blank screen, you tend to wonder if anybody if everybody went to lunch or not. <laughs> right, right. And I guess that's what we're a while ago, y'all said y'all couldn't hear me, and it's saying that our broadband width uh, is low, so I didn't know if y'all could hear us. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. No, I just, uh, I think to seize the moment, the opportunities that we have, right now, Ricky and I find ourselves not around a lot of people. Um, so I have a confession. I find myself, I don't seem to have much wor worth as far as what do I do with myself? It seems like my kids are grown. I'm in this phase now in my life. And it's just Ricky and I, and we don't have much socializing because we moved and we're hardly around any people. And so I find myself very, I can get depressed because I don't have, seems like a purpose in my life. And so I struggle with that right now. And, and that's where I'm at. And I think, well, maybe I need a volunteer and volunteer and, and just hold somebody's hand, a volunteer with hospice because I've seen that work in my family when my family needed hospice and the compassion that they have and, you know, just to hold somebody's hand, you know. And so there's where my struggle is, is I find myself that what purpose I have and at this place in my life because my kids are all grown and they have their old families and it's just Ricky and I now. And, and then we moved and so we have no friends, we have no fellowship, we have, you know, and so I find my days uh, struggling uh, to uh, have a purpose in my life right now. That's where I'm at. Yeah, I hear you. I have, um, it's hard. I know my, my daughter is, um, well, I don't want to talk about her, but um, it's hard understanding, especially, you know, yeah, I, I can relate. I don't want to repeat what you just said because I hear you. You do have purpose. I mean, you do have a purpose for being here and you do have value, um, enormous value. And like just listening to George and just the, for the few minutes that he was talking, I mean, I gleaned so much from that. I'm like, you know, I wish I had you here around my kids on a regular basis or at least semi-regular to, to glean some of this um, insight that we take for granted. Um, but yeah, volunteer work. I, I was just thinking after hearing Kelly, um, you know, I am going to write a letter. I, I mean, I signed a card uh, from my friend. Um, <coughs> along with everybody else in the in the class signed the card for her regarding the the loss of her husband but i i want to write her a letter and listening to to george i'm thinking you know it's important for us to be real with people and we all have the the common ground of being human and even though we have different sets of experiences we can relate even if we haven't had the same experience we can relate how something feels to be alone or how when you have a death in the family and how you cope with it and maybe it doesn't look as pretty or as acceptable um to other people the way you handle it but that's how you handle it and people can relate to that knowing that well maybe i don't relate that way 
but the way I relate, you know, whatever. And um, it's just being, being real with people. And honestly, Martha, the idea of having someone hold someone's hand, that's a huge thing. Um, I regret not being able to be there for my dad in his last year. Um, even though I was here, I wasn't, he was in a nursing home just 10 minutes from here. And, um, I, I wish there was somebody, I know that that was there to do that for him. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking. Thank you for sharing Martha. Uh, I just want to tell you, uh, Ricky and Martha, that it's an honor for me <clears throat> for having my children see you, a couple that's been together for 42 years and will be together for more. I mean, the fact that you're still together, living that way, I mean... People should know couples like you. I mean, you yes. know, yes. that's a small thing among many other things, you know. I mean, <laughs> wow, 42 years. Yeah. So for, for that thing alone, you know, it's important that you exist, you know. That's one of your purpose among many others. Yeah. So... Please don't don't think less of yourself. You know we we think highly of you. You know, forty two years, and you look so young. I'm not sure though about getting married uh, ten years old though. <laughs> yeah, all the stuff we appreciate that. I, I think your story, your testimony, Ricky and Martha, of everything you've been through when, when Ricky was sick and all of that, and just how to be a wife yes. through that, you have a big story to share with a lot of people. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of people that are suffering that just need to know how you did it and what you did and, and um, how you continue to do it. And you give all the glory to the Father. You're a great example, great witness. Yes. So I, I would find somebody that will hear your story. We have challenges in this culture. They don't appreciate gray hair. They don't appreciate the wisdom. And it's, it's hard. But we all need to be, the older folks need to be out there sharing with the younger people. To, if they would just hear, there's just so much heartache they could miss. Yeah. So, so your testimony is very powerful as, as a couple, as a family what you've been through. So share that. I, I found it very compelling myself. Just when you guys were out here, it's uh, I think my computer's going slow. I just want to second what everyone else is saying, Ricky and Martha. Um, I'm just so thankful that you're here. I remember when you, you said one week um, about Christmas and how you're, you could hear your son, you know, saying, oh, mom, what are you doing now? And it, it was just an encouragement to me because um, um, <laughs> just to see you standing up and saying, but we're still going to do what's right. We know we're going to do what's right. And it's, it's hard. It's hard to um, have your family not understand you, what you're doing, and especially like when you make this change later in life and your children are grown and then they're like, I don't understand what's going on with you and you've left the faith and um, you've let us down or, you know, things like that. And um, so it's just an encouragement to me to see you guys um, really standing strong in that. And if I'm going to pray that, <laughs> that you will have opportunities to share your story and, you know, if it's volunteering at a, a hospice, we just went through that with my dad and, and it was very meaningful to have, um, she was an unbeliever, you know, but just having someone come who's compassionate and will share, you know, 
in your grief. And I think um, that's a, a super neat avenue that you could be involved in. But, you know, whatever it is, find something that you can be involved in because you have, you guys really do, like everyone is saying, have so much to offer. And it would just be, um, I think that idea of just bringing light into the world, you're bringing more light, you're sharing that light and, um, and, and spreading good in the world. It, I think it's just a great concept to think about that, how there's lots and lots of darkness. Well, I think about this sometimes with, I've worked with refugees quite a bit from Bhutan and they're Hindus. And I think about the fact that so many refugees are coming to America with their religion, whether it's Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. And it's changing the, it's changing um, our culture in, a, in quite, a, quite a big way because they chant and they pray uh, in these pujas, they're calling the gods, they're calling them, calling them to these places uh, where they are. And, and so it's like, oh, it's like the spotlight's getting turned on us, all these, on America where we weren't, where we typically weren't calling on all these Buddhist, Hindu um, gods. Now there's many, many people calling on them. They, they ring a bell and chant. And, and um, so there, I think that they're just bringing a lot more of that darkness here. Because when you think, if you, I don't know if you've heard the phrase 1040 window, but the, those countries that are in those um, longitude lines are very dark. There's a stronghold of Satan there because that's where Islam and Buddhism were founded and, um, and Hinduism. So anyway, those have been very dark and oppressed countries. And now all those people are coming here <laughs> and they, you know, they've come to Europe. So if we aren't actively out there sharing our light, then how, you know, how are we going to push back some of that darkness? It's just a thought I had. Yeah, if we're representing the truth of who the creator is, that is a lot of light to push back against the darkness. I think the problem with Christianity is really not an answer against these other religions. It's just another religion with its own own gods. I mean, that means the, the, few, of, the few people like us that are really trying to seek the heart of it, we really got to, we can't be lied to and, and convinced to just sit back in the on the sidelines or oh you're not worth anything you don't have anything to offer those are all lies we have a ton to offer and we got a lot of work to do all of us everybody here in this room anyway yeah let me just say for carrie i was this was like a number of years ago i was talking to these hindu people about um how jesus was born of a virgin <laughs> And, and I thought, oh, they're going to think this is pretty hard to believe when I say this, you know, but it's a miracle, you know, it's not, we can't understand it, you know, and uh, they were like, oh, that's nothing. He said Krishna was born of a virgin too. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> and then Krishna is this blue boy that suckles from a cow, you know, and I'm just like, oh my goodness, <laughs> how do we get connected? I, and I, again, I think it's, Oh, it was a lie of Satan. He wanted to bring all these other virgin births about before the real one so that everyone would be deceived. And, you know, anyway, it was, <laughs> it was uh, awkward. Yeah, I had a thought earlier. I was watching a video in the last 24 hours, um, and it made me think about a way of delivering a message. When we have a message that we want to share with other people, how do we get it out to the people? And for so long, I've used Facebook as my platform um, to, to be public. And I'm feeling more and more disillusioned with it because of how it's Anyway, <laughs> um, but so this morning I, I was thinking grassroots. The thought came to my mind, grassroots. And I remember when I used to be very politically active, um, I was on the ground floor. I was in the grassroots movement uh, in our local area. 
in getting the word out about whatever my hot topic was at the time. And I would go out on the streets and I would carry signs and I would be making on the news. I was on national public radio and I was on the, um, just getting out there, just being out there, going against the conventional means of communicating. And, um, and I'm not suggesting that we go stand on the corner with signs or anything, but I'm thinking we need to think outside the box um, to think that we can beat. And I'm not even, I, I, I don't mean to phrase it in a competitive way, but in a way um, you've got all these ministries out there that established institutions of reaching people that are ineffective. Um, so, but yet they're more effective than if we try to combat them on that level. You know what I mean? If we try to do what they're doing, but we're going to do it better. Um, you know, it's, we got to think outside the box. And ultimately the thing about grassroots movements are you're dealing from the bottom up instead of the top down and you're dealing with people mano to mano. I don't know if that's right face to face. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think that's, that's where we need to be. And that's, that's what Yeshua did. Um, he ministered face to face with people. And while there be crowds that would come around him, um, he was available. He wasn't just holed up in the temple and just, you know, thought, okay, anybody wants to hear what I have to say, come see me next Saturday, you know he was out there in and amongst the people. Um, so anyway, and we just need to be bold and, and wise and gentle. You know, we need to always be following the leading of the spirit, follow, you know, pray for, for direction. And then when, when he puts that lifeboat in front of you, or he puts that opportunity in front of you, we need to recognize that that's an opportunity that he's put in front of us. The father has put in front of us to seize and, um, and not, not let fear of anything hold us back. Uh, if this is truly what the father wants for us. But anyway, just thoughts. Yeah. Er everybody in this room is the answer to somebody's prayer right around them. We all have, the little light we have is a big thing to push back the darkness. We all have a lot of work to do and it's not hard to find. You just have to know and look and like Carrie saying, be sensitive. Um, our purposes, we have many purposes. Our father is going to use us. He's going to use us who we are, as we are, where we come from, all the stuff we overcome to be where we're at. We're a great testimony to the greatness of our father even in our broken state, even in our, even with our own hangups, we're still beautiful. We're still taken after our father. So don't ever d diminish that at all. Just walk in that and you will find, you will find a place right where you are. I, I promise you it, it's everywhere. It, it's a, a dying and hurt world out there. And um, anyway, and people are looking for the real. They're looking for, because the virtual reality, it's fun and games for a time, but ultimately people want what's real. And I, I even meant the kids. The kids, they have just as much work to do, the young ones, just in the, in the world. They're very special. They, they're in a place we never were. And they're going to really do some, some good stuff. I want to um, share with Martha that I hear you, you know, regarding depression. And um, because like me, I, I still have my family. I still homeschool our youngest. and. Um, but it can be very lonely, even, even, 
with you know with my family here with me it it's it can be very lonely because i i think we are made to be with made for fellowship we are created for fellowship <laughs> to be you know in a community to be with each other and so um we all grew up um having people around us having the same faith with everybody around us just being normal <laughs> and now we're you know we have come out of the system <laughs> and so it it can be very lonely um but at the same time, it's very fulfilling. Like, I can't imagine going back to <laughs> the way it was, even being surrounded by people. Like, many times when we were still in Vancouver, I would, you know, um, attempt to visit our former church and be with our former church mates, but it's not the same anymore. Like, it, it, it's more lonely to be with <laughs> than to be not with them <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> so yes it, it, it saddens me more when i see them and when i see where they're at and where i'm at in my walk and i but i can't do anything i can't share anything because their eyes and ears are closed and it, it's it grieves me maybe because like we have a glimpse of the father's heart and it grieves him more right so um Yes, but um, I'm very thankful, you know, that th this is answered prayer. Everybody here is answered prayer. <laughs> and so, yes, and I'm very thankful that you have joined us. And um, I, I missed you last Shabbat. <laughs> because I learned so much from your insights as well. <laughs> so thank you, Martha. Thank you. Yeah, I'm the same way, okay? Like, I can't, I almost can't do it anymore. My daughter goes to this this church that we all kind of come out of. The only right church there is, the Church of Christ. If you don't believe it, you ask them. But anyway, um, yeah, I've gone to a few times here and there, and I, I just, I sit there and I look at all the, the plastic is all I can think of. It's like, this is plastic. You know, the preacher's up there, doing his thing and all the words are on the building and it sounds good. Don't get me wrong. As a musician, I'm thinking, God, ah, I can dig this entertainment stuff. But anyway, it's like, it's so empty and it, and it, I, I just can't do it. Every once in a while I'll go, cause dad, come on go to church. Oh, okay. You know, I'll try to be there. What time y'all getting out? <laughs> you know, but anyway, I, it's hard to do. It really is. I mean, and, and you have, I, she, we get along really great, my daughter and I, and she's got a really, she is impressive with her thoughts and all that. And we will ar not argue, but I love this. I can, I can say things to her and she will decipher and come back. And it, it's very insightful. There, I, I got hope, you know, but it, I just can't do the, the churchy thing with her. Not, not in that church. It's, and it's even gotten worse and quote, more entertainment value and talking about Christmas and Easter and oh my God, I, it just sickens me. It kind of makes me, ugh, I got to get out of here. But you know, I love her dearly and, and I, you know, we don't fight about that. You know, I can't contend with her. I can do my points. Well, I believe this. Okay, dad, I can see that, you know, but I, but this, this, this and grandma and all them go there, you know, so she's caught in that. And, and I understand that. And, and I don't know it all for one thing. So, you know, anyway, I, I do agree with that, Kay. It's hard to go back and visit, you know, especially in that, in that building personally. It, I just, it, it, I get a, a feeling in the spirit of I'm being smothered here or I'm, you know, I'm just surrounding myself by plastic, like I'm in plastic wrap. But anyway, so to say to that. Uh, I, I know everybody here well enough to just a little slightly off point, but thank you, George. Um, that was good. Uh, um, loneliness is a tool that's used against us. We all have come through so much and we're left in a lonely place and the, the wilderness is a lonely place. So 
we have to get through that and be tough. We're, we're like early bloomers in the garden. You are going to come up in a tough environment and you got to hold your ground in order to thrive. And, but the fruit will come later. So just be encouraged. That loneliness is a lie. You're not alone. We, but we all felt like, well, man, am I the only one? We've all felt that. And it's like my family's suffering. And, you know, it, there's a lot of challenges because we're facing so much. We're coming against so much. But that's why we have to hold our ground and work hard at it and not give up and really represent our Father. That's, that's what the first fruits are about. That's what being of the household of the Messiah in the, in the truest way. It's going to be lonely. Look what he went through. He died alone on that cross. And, and, and it's different than what we put on it through Christianity. But the fact is, is he was alone and rejected and despised. And he was holy and he was good. He did it all right. And that's what it cost him. But then look how much glory he brought to his father. So don't let the loneliness get you down. It's, it's an attack and it's a good weapon. So we're not alone. We look, just look around. We all have each other right here. We, and it's virtual. I get it. But it doesn't have to always be that way. We just have to do where, what we can where we're at. So that's, I'm done. Yeah, I I agree wholeheartedly. Um, thank you, Ty. That was spot on. And I um another thought that came to my mind as far as a tool of the enemy is to to shut us up is to think that what we have gone through is either um, not that big of a deal. I mean, we know. We know when we really rationalize, yes, we've gone through a lot and there is, it is a big deal. But when you're feeling low and you're feeling like nobody wants to hear what you have to say and everywhere you turn around, it's like people don't even care about what's true anymore. They just want whatever makes them feel good and or whatever everyone else is doing, what's socially acceptable or um, what they're familiar with. That's all they want and they're, they're content with that. And after a while, it, it can get you to feel like, why do I even bother? <laughs> you know, I think I'd rather be by myself than be around. But um, the enemy will use all sorts of tactics to get us to be quiet, to, to stop testifying of whatever um, we had to say, whatever that is. And if it's sharing your personal testimony of health struggles or, or um, you know, past addictive behaviors, or I don't know, whatever our testimony is in any area of our lives, um, the enemy would like nothing better than to us not share it. <laughs> um, and, and to make it sound like nobody cares, um, or it's not that big of a deal, um, or, you know, so what? Don't buy that either, because, um, there is value in each one of our lives and in each experience that we've gone through. Um, keep telling yourself that there is value in you. Yeah. When, when you get out of the desert, when you get out of the wilderness, the real ministry begins. So it's, it's like, how tough are you? Are you going to, you going to stick it out or are you going to turn back like Lot's wife or, or whatever? So it's a testing process and it's making us strong. You know, if you, if you're um, raising a greenhouse as a tomato plant, you never get wind on your rain or the harsh, you're, you're never going to have any fruit. You got to be outside in the sun and, and, and uh, then you'll produce it, You can't be, we got to be strong. So, Whatever, any, whenever you get down, know that it's, I, I think it will get better. I think it's just a trial. It's just a strengthening period. Our, our father loves us. He doesn't want us to be weak because we're going to have to be pretty strong. To, we, we have to be strong to get where we already are uh, or he's strong through us. It's, I'm not trying to say it's all us or anything like that, but we got to go through this stuff. It's part of it. 
and, and if you don't, if we don't, if we're not willing, we might as well just quit and go back to the church. The, the plastic, like George is saying. I guess it's hard to. Do you hear me now? <laughs> this uh, Hebrews five a. Although he was a son, learned obedience from what he suffered, and being perfected, he became a source of salvation to those who obeyed him. Ah, uh, internet is unstable. Oh, it's muted. Did y'all hear me? You were breaking up some. Martha. I know. You know it, it keeps saying our internet is weak. Right. Were you reading were you Hebrews, Hebrews 5, um, verse 8 and 9? Uh, 5, 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Yes, and if you um, continue reading that in verse 9, I mean, to me, when I first read this uh, verse, this passage lately, it showed me that this is, this is how to stop sinning. It's talking about how to stop sinning. And when I share this with, um, I remember former church mate, um, it's like they don't get it. I said, there is a way to stop sinning. We don't have to be sinners to be close to Jesus Christ. He's, he commands us to stop sinning. And this is connected with First Peter 4, verse 1 to 5. It's all about how to stop sinning. It's, you know, by what we suffered um, it's the flesh. When we remove the flesh, our fleshly desires, we suffer, yes, but we are being perfected. We learn obedience. And what is the, the reward of it all is um, everlasting deliverance. Uh, um, that's why this is a wonderful passage that you, you know, you pointed us to. It's, it's very encouraging. <laughs> I love this chapter five. I I just I just loved it. So it's a Hebrew study after all. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I went back um, to uh, Leviticus about the the priest uh, offerings. See if I can find it. Um, it talks about Moses' two sons when they offered the uh, the fire that God did not command. Leviticus ten one, where uh, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu each took his own censer and they put fire in them. And placed incense on it. Then they present it before Yahweh, illegitimate, illegitimate fire, which he had not commanded them. And then Moses tells Aaron in Leviticus 10:3, "Among those who are close to me, I will show myself holy, and in the presence of all the people, I will display my glory." And to me, that was saying they weren't holy before Yahweh. And here where they were uh, creating something that God, uh, Yahweh did not require. And then I went to um, Exodus where um, lights had sinned with the golden calf. And Moses goes before Yahweh to intercede for them. And he talks about 
If you don't go before us, then how are they going to know that you're with us? The distinction between us and them and the other nations, if you don't go before us. And Yahweh says, then I will show you glory, show me your glory. And he's talking to him face to face. And to me, that was the, the um, being, uh, having the intimacy with Yahweh, where once you know Yahweh, you don't want to sin. You don't want to offend him. Because you want that closeness, you want that intimacy with him, where the Israelites did not have that, or they wouldn't have done what they did. And Moses had that with Yahweh, that intimacy. And in having that intimacy and that relationship with him, Yahweh would display his glory. And you see Yeshua having that intimacy, Father, and that closeness and that relationship of I don't want to sin. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to offend you. He had that closeness and that desire not wanting to do that. And that's where the perfection came forth of the Father through him, the essence of the Father coming forth and demonstrating the glory of Yahweh through him so the people would see it. And the love of Yahweh for the people in his obedience to the Father and that loving compassion that he had for him. I don't want to sin. I'm not wanting to do this. I mean, as far as sinning. And that's how he became to be the son of Yahweh, in which we're all called to be that as well. You know, so his glory can be seen through us, his vessels, his instruments. So anyway, that was what I got from the reading this morning from Hebrews 5. They're muted. Yeah, I think what you're saying is um, we want to be pleasing in our Father's sight. Yes. Because we're we're children that now want to obey. Obedience is, you know, we've taken it to heart. We want to obey. It's beyond making excuses not to obey. We seek to obey our Father to please Him, to be an example to those around us. But this psalm I just quoted, Psalm 37, 4, I think nobody, a lot of people anyway, don't really get it. When he is our desire, that's what we get. When, when we make him the desire of what we do, we become his children. <laughs> it's not about getting a new Mercedes. It's about our inheritance is the Father. That's the, that's the real priesthood right there. So, I mean, that's just what, what you were talking about, Martha. That's what, what made me think that. Able to lead others to him. And that's where the church or the institutions has failed man. And that's why we see such a big mess in humanity. Because we failed in that role or not knowing. And now that the Father filling it to us uh, to step step up the game or step up, you know, what he is desiring from us, that capacity and that role that he's placed us in because of uh, when God created humanity in the image and likeness of him, what a big uh, status, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. You know, in, in, and that was the role that we were supposed Play as a as the humans, but we of course we failed. But yet God has a greater plan, you know, in that because He still wants to use us. That never stopped. That never stopped of being who we are. Uh, it's still in God's plan using us in His to, to reach humanity in our in our sphere in our role in, in where we're at. Hey, Michael. Hey, we got a new guy here. Hey, <laughs> introduce yourself, man. Where's your older brother? <laughs> the one that weighs a lot more. <clears throat> Looking great.
Can you hear me yet? Okay. Shabbat shalom, Michael. Shabbat shalom. <clears throat> I was sleeping. And I was doing it very well. <laughs> Did you catch anything that was said, Michael? Did you hear any of it? No, just a little bit of what uh, Ms. Martha was saying. We'll, we'll continue with it. I don't, I don't think he knows what we've been talking about for the last hour. No, give, me, give me a brief introduction and I'll roll with it. <clears throat> Go ahead, Ty. Oh, go ahead. I we've been talking about um, ministry, basically. How do we minister? Uh, okay. And we were, we were talking about some of the um, the attacks against us to make us feel like we're alone. Okay. And um, well, and I just how do we bloom where we're planted, and how do we represent our Father and all of that? Well, I can tell you the very first thing that came to mind when you said, how do we minister? I want you to think about your children. So we can tell our children how, what to do all day long. But if they don't see us do what we tell them to do, then how, how, how should we expect them to do it? So our children, and I, I was a child once, and I know this from experience. When I was an adolescent, I smoked cigarettes. And I smoked cigarettes, can't blame it on my mother, but she smoked cigarettes too. My aunt smoked cigarettes, they all smoked cigarettes. So it wasn't a far leap for me to smoke too. Even though my mother said not to smoke because it's bad for you. But I learned more from what she did than I did from what she said for me to do. Um, now I haven't smoked a cigarette since June of 2009. Um, praise the Father for that. but. But the point that I'm trying to make is our, the reason the Father told us to be fruitful and multiply is because he wants to teach us his ways. And that's only one way we can learn. He is our Father, our provider, our protector, our redeemer, just as we should be to our children. He's our teacher. What did he do in the wilderness but teach his children how to honor his word? Now, we can tell, we can get a bullhorn, stand on the corner and shout and scream till our lungs don't work. It's not gonna do any good. It doesn't matter how many signs you make. It doesn't matter how many people you save. Um, what matters is what we do with the, with, the, with the dominion and the commands we've been given. And the way that we minister to people most effectively is to lead by example is to follow the Father's ways and to follow the example of Messiah, to be compassionate, to be loving, to be the example and the reflection of his grace and his mercy and his love. And, and there's, a, there's a quote, I forget who said it, but it says, be the change you wish to see. And we can complain about people, we can, we can, we can bicker, we can argue, we can fight. But it's no, it does no justice to our Father. It doesn't bring his name to esteem. But, it, but to complain and to bicker, it's of no, it's, it's, it, it's, it, does no, it does a disservice to him. But what we should do, if we do have a complaint that's genuine, is go to him in prayer and seek a solution. And by changing our attitude and our, and our reactions and our actions to do these things and to put him first and to seek his answer, um, then what happens is everyone around us sees that eventually. But that's not why we do it. That just, that just becomes a byproduct and we become more like Abraham in that people want to know 
what it is that you have. Why are you so happy? Why are you prospering? What are you doing? And then you have opportunities to share the, 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 the lifestyle in which you chose to serve the Father. And it's not just something you talk about, but it's something that you live. Um, there's this huge thing going on in the world with there's, there's my life and there's my church life. There's my, there's my life and then there's my real life and then there's my biblical life. And they're two separate things. So all week long in the work, I'm me. And then when, on, when, you know, when it's time, when I'm around church people or when I'm at church or wherever they go, then I'm the Bible guy. But there can't be a separation. You have to be the same person all the time and, and make a decision whether that's going to be the, the Hellenistic, you know, Greek mindset thinking, you know, humanistic person. Or are we going to be a person who submits to God, to, to God or the Father um, all the time? That doesn't mean we don't make mistakes and don't screw up. That's how we know we're human. But what do we do after that? Do we continue in? Oh, I'm already late. I might as well not go to work right now. You know, or do we, do we snap to it and try to make up for our mistakes and change? Um, so it's really not an easy question as to how do we minister because we can minister in so many different ways, but the, the most effective way that I've seen in my life that we should minister is first to focus on ourselves because if we're no good for, if we can't take care of ourselves, if we can't be accountable to the father for our own actions, then how in the world do we try to pretend like we can tell other people's how to how people how to do it? Just like if, as a father, if I don't have a means to take care of myself, then how can I take care of my family? Which is why Paul, Shaul said that if you want to be a teacher, you know, not saying I want to be a teacher, but there's, there's credentials that should be met in order to, to, in order to be taken seriously by the congregation as a leader. To have one wife, to, 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 to not be given over to strong drink, to not, all these different qualities and the, and the, and the Proverbs and the Psalms talk about all kinds of things about foolishness and not to, not to hang out with these kind of people and those kind of people. And there's a reason for all that. It's not because the father hates people. It's because those actions and those behaviors lead away from him. So we need to make sure that we're not accompanying or embodying the actions and the, and, and the, and the uh, behaviors that lead the other way. So, it, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but that, that's, that's the gist of what I understand as far as ministry goes. Because people think ministry means you grab a Bible and you start reading it in the street with a big bullhorn. Or, or, that, you go, or that you go to the church and you stand in the parking lot and you pass out flyers as to why the church is going to hell. That's not ministry. That's not ministry at all. What that is is condemnation. And we're not called to condemn anyone. Once a person once told me that you can pull a string and you can bring it very far if you just pull it. But if you try to push it, it's going to get all knotted up. And, and who are we to think that we have the right, any of us, to be parking lot preachers and to condemn other people with fire and brimstone because they don't say a name right or, 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 or whatever the case. That's not ministry. That is not ministry. That is condemnation. And I don't care if your mouth says, Jesus died for you. He loves you, you dirty Muslim. That is not ministry. It's not. Yahushua didn't do that. So that's kind of a, a little peek into my mind <laughs> on ministry. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. You're welcome. Uh, it was good to have you back, my friend. Good to be back. We missed you. Carrie, did you want to um, 
start something. <clears throat> a one. Well, we kind of, I didn't really have anything planned. I talked about what I was on my mind an hour ago, and this is <laughs> what's come a result of all that. Um, if there's something in particular that someone uh, wants to talk about or has a question about um, that is that somebody in this room could help the others, you know, that, that can give an answer or can feed the discussion um, that would be beneficial to all, uh, we can talk about that. Minister to one another right now, you mean? Yeah, minister, if somebody had minister in our own house, so to speak. I mean, if that's what you want to do. Well, does anybody have a, a need or a concern or a situation that they want advice on from the rest of us? Is anybody struggling in their life? Do you want to do you want to end the recording here? I don't know about talking about too much personal stuff in the recording. Keep it going and just talk about what anybody wants to talk about. If you don't want to bring it up. Okay. It's, what do you what do you what, what do you think? I think we should leave it going for an hour. I think okay. Ricky should, I, I'm I think, just I think Ricky should play a song. <laughs> Love you, Ricky. Their internet's going really slow. All right, well, just stop the recording and let Michael tell us what's been going on. <laughs>